So Christianity stands or falls with the resurrection. You disprove the resurrection and we're done. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 17, Paul writes, If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll spend some time today in 1 Corinthians 15 and Acts chapter 1 and a couple other places. Um, so we wouldn't be resurrected either. One of our hope, one of our hopes is our glorification, the glorified bodies. We get new bodies after this life. That's good news. For, for any of us, I maybe young, young people might not be able to grasp the, the reality and the, the, appreciate that fact that you'll get new bodies because yours is fine now. But just wait if you live another 30 years. Um, so we would be out of hope and out of luck. Um, think about the beginnings. Christianity had really humble beginnings. No money, no proven leaders, um, no technological tools for promoting the gospel. Um, Christianity faced enormous obstacles in the culture and the society in, in Rome or in, in Jerusalem with the Romans there and with the Jews. It was a brand new thing. It taught bold truths that are incredible. The truths that we have to believe in, incredible, and it, it was subject to the most severe and intense hatred and persecution. So that's what early Christians had going for them. <laughs> so why then have so many followers and disciples of Christ and martyrs through the centuries, why have they been willing to die for their faith instead of deny their faith or deny Jesus? Why? They must have believed it was true for some reason. So anyone could have examined the empty tomb that Sunday morning. Anyone. I mean, the, later on in the day, a couple days later, anyone, whether you be, believed, whether you, was, you were one of the disciples of Jesus, or whether you were an unbeliever, whether you were a Jew, whether you were a pagan, a Roman, you could have heard about this thing, and you could have gone physically to the empty tomb and looked and seen for yourself. Well, it doesn't mean they believed, right? But they could look and see, wow, there's no body in there. Well, I guess that part is true. So there is, even the Jews testified to the fact that Jesus' body was not there, that the tomb was empty. So they could, anyone could have gone to look. So how would you disprove Christianity? Just produce a body. Produce the corpse. Parade it through the street. Put it out there. But they couldn't, could they? They didn't. So that's one thing to think about. So the resurrection is real, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I've got a quote from J. Warner Wallace. He's a cold case homicide detective, former atheist, now an apologist. He's now an author. Uh, he also works part-time at Biola University in California. Here's what he said. I am not a Christian because it serves my own selfish, pur selfish purposes. So let me parenthetically insert here, Christianity is not about living your best life now. All right? If we could live our best life now, what do we need heaven for? What do we need eternal life for? If this life is the best that it gets. Oh, God, help us. <laughs> I'm not a Christian because it works for me. I had a life prior to Christianity that seemed to be working just fine. And my life as a Christian hasn't always been easy. I'm a Christian because it's true. I'm a Christian because I want to live in a way that reflects the truth. I'm a Christian because of my high regard for the truth. It leaves me no other alternative. So he did the investigation. That's what we're going to do a little bit of this morning. Since the resurrection is pivotal to Christianity, then investigating the claims, proving the resurrection is of infinite importance. So the Bible states that believers fled for refuge. I love this, this picture in these words. Fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. And Hebrews 6.19 says this, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner entered for us, even Jesus. So 
This is referring to the hope the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation and glorification of these bodies, new bodies. The anchor symbolizes keeping believers secure during times of trouble. This hope we have is an anchor of our soul. What's our soul? Our mind, our will, and our emotions. The veil, this is exciting, you guys. The veil was the curtain that once blocked the entrance of the most holy place or the holy of holies where the high priest would go in and offer sacrifices for the sins of the people and for himself. Only the high priest was allowed in God's presence. If you think about that veil, if you're familiar with the story, we'll, we'll go through it next month because we're going to celebrate Easter. We're going to celebrate the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. The veil in the temple it was, from what I understand, it was 30 feet tall, all right, 30 feet tall, and it was four inches thick. That's about, I think that's about four inches. And it was made of this thick, thick um, material, heavy curtain. And I'm going to just, don't, don't turn there, I'm going to read this from Matthew 27, 50 and 51. Jesus was on the cross, the last moments. It says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Why, why is that significant? Most of you know this. From top to bottom. Man couldn't have done that. 30 feet tall? 30 feet high? That's three basketball hoops. That's way up there. From top to bottom, it was torn in the middle, right down the middle. God showed that when my son died on the cross, the sacrifice was complete. The work was finished. Now, man could enter right into the presence of God. It says, that verse again, Jesus was the forerunner for us. He entered in the presence behind the veil. Now there's no more veil. Hebrews 4, I believe it's 4.16, it says we can now boldly approach the throne of God. We don't have to quiver. We don't have to, of course, we're reverent. He's a holy God. We might crawl, but we don't have to be fearful that he's going to wipe us out or squash us like a bug. He says, come boldly and receive mercy and grace when you need it. So we can go right to the presence. We don't need a mediator. We don't need a man. We don't need a priest. We don't need a friend. We can go right to God Amen. in the name of Jesus. Before we get to our main text, let's look at some extra biblical sources, sources outside the Bible. First of all, a historian, his name was Thallus, one of several non-biblical pagan historians writing about that time. He wrote about the darkness during the day, during that, those three hours, when Jesus, the six hours, the three hours there was darkness when Jesus was on the cross, not for the full six, followed by an earthquake that occurred at the point of Jesus' crucifixion. This is outside the Bible. Okay? So, so much of this, what we're going to share in these next few minutes, blows away the, the idea that Jesus was just a myth and never existed. It's hard to have conversations with people like that, but they're out there. Okay? That means they're not even willing to look at historical references and others that wrote outside the Bible. They're not willing to look at the Bible as reliable and inspired, which we know it is. Next, Roman historian Suetonius wrote about the new levels of punishment that Nero, at the time, was inflicting on Christians. And he, Suetonius, described the fact that Jesus had an immediate impact on his followers, and he empowered them to die courageously for what they knew to be true. Next, Jewish historian Josephus lived in the first century. He wrote about Jesus in more detail than anyone else, any other non-biblical source. And he was a Jew. He wasn't a believer. But he wrote about what he knew, what people observed. He was a historian. We might consider him a journalist, historian today. Now, the next one, second century Roman historian Tacitus confirms that Christianity was founded by a man named Christus, Christus or Christus, whom he said was, quote, put to death as a criminal by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. 
Well, we can look at that and go, okay, even if that was outside the Bible and that, this guy uh, Tacitus wrote that, it still doesn't matter. Caiaphas, who was that? He never existed. And Pontius Pilate, what a name. What is that? You know, what, he, he probably never existed either. Well, Jesus was on trial before Caiaphas. He was then taken to Pilate. The tomb, this is inconvenient for a lot of atheists and skeptics, by the way. Archaeology is very inconvenient. The tomb of Caiaphas, the family uh, tomb, was discovered in 1990 in Jerusalem. Inside were the very bones of the infamous high priest mentioned in the Gospels. Caiaphas, there it is. As for Pontius Pilate, well, there was not much evidence of his existence either. Did he really exist? Did he really stand before Jesus and send him to the crucifixion? Well, uh, there was a first century inscription discovered at Caesarea in 1961 that confirmed that he was indeed the procurator of Judea from 26 to 36 AD. Just, hmm, that's just what the Bible taught. Question. Uh, Christianity was a threat to the religious leaders at that time, to the Jews. Christianity was a threat to the Romans. Why? Because of their thought of revolt. Well, if more people start following this Jesus and he... He's already getting thousands of people behind him. They might revolt. So the Jews were afraid of Christianity. The Romans were afraid of Christianity. Why do you think then, you know they tried to, to disprove the resurrection. You know, without reading anything, you know, just common sense and reason tells you they would go investigate and try to find that body of Jesus. Right? Without reading anything else. It's just common sense. But we have the Bible to back it up. Why then do you think that the Romans and the Jews did not refute Jesus' resurrection and stop this new thing, the way, Christianity, before it began? Why? Why do you think they did not? I'm here to suggest to you because they could not. Hundreds of thousands, or at least hundreds or thousands of eyewitnesses were around for one thing, Paul testifies about that. We'll get to that a little bit in 1 Corinthians in a minute. So Jesus um, did many miracles. A lot of people saw him. And I'm not even talking about after his resurrection and appearances. I'm talking about his miracles that people saw and witnessed. The word would spread with just one miraculous deed. The word would spread whether you have a 24-7 news cycle or uh, iPhones or technology or the internet or television or not, the word would spread. Okay? So let's look at the gospel. Open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's look at the gospel. Now, this letter is encouraging. Some of you might not realize this was written approximately um, 50 AD, 5-0. So that's between... 15 and 20 years after the resurrection is when this was written. Why do I say that? Because a lot of people, skeptics might say, oh, the, why do you, how can you believe the Bible? It was written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after the events happened. And that's just a lie. These are not intelligent people that make that argument, okay? They come from the same intelligence of the people that say Jesus was a myth and never existed. I, be patient with them, <laughs> but refute the facts with the truth when you're talking to these people. So, 1 Corinthians 15, let's look at the gospel. Paul writes, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received. Stop right there. Understand that they already received this. Before they received the letter, the paper letter from Paul, they were already reciting. They had 1 Corinthians 15 memorized. A lot of people say that this was, these first eight verses were like a, almost like a, a, a poem, something that rhymes it, that they would try to remember. So they had a lot of scripture memorized before they even received the letters. Understand that. It traveled fast before the letters were copied and reproduced and sent to the churches. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel I preached to you, in which you also received, in which you stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Here we go. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, 
So Paul, years ago, remember he was on the road to Damascus, he also received this gospel. He got saved and then went out and spent three years with some of the disciples to learn. And actually, he went out and spent time with God so he could understand the scriptures and understand the Messiah, the Messianic prophecies. So as soon as he got saved, he went out and spent time in the Word. I think it was three years. It talks about that in Galatians. What I also received, here we go, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Where, what were the scriptures? The Old Testament, the prophecies, the prophets. Okay? And that, verse 5, here we go, he appeared to Cephas. Uh-oh. Yee, you better back this up if you're going to mention people by name. You better back this up if you're putting these claims down on paper to be permanent. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, some have died. What does that mean? Most of the people, the hundreds and hundreds that saw Jesus, were still alive. They hadn't died yet at the time this was written. No wonder the Jews and the Romans couldn't stop the truth from spreading. Too many people saw Jesus. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Verse 8, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Paul was saying, well, I didn't get to be uh, one of the apostles, original apostles, but boy, did God use Paul, right? Now, this is interesting. Josephus, that Jewish historian we mentioned earlier, he also, outside the Bible, he testifies that James, the half-brother of Jesus, he was the leader at the Jerusalem Council, by the way. If you look at Acts chapter 15, James was a pillar in the early church. But talk about an amazing conversion and transformation. James was a skeptic. Do you remember even before the Passover, before Jesus came into town, came into Jerusalem, um, it says even his own brothers didn't believe in him. I want you to just grasp that truth. So here's James. He didn't want any part of it. Jesus is doing all these things, and, but he couldn't grasp that he lived in my house growing up. He can't be God. He's doing all these miracles, and James didn't know how to grasp it, but he can't be God. But guess what? He had a turnaround, and it was pretty dramatic to go from skeptic, and then after the resurrection, you're mentioned with the apostles, you're in the early church council in Jerusalem, and you're a martyr for your faith. James ended up being executed, according to tradition and according to Josephus. How do you explain that? Well, it's right here. Verse 7. Then Jesus appeared to James. Well, this is not Peter, James, and John. and It's not that James. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus that was raised in the household. Jesus appeared to James one-on-one. -on -one, said, here I am. Now will you believe? I can't imagine what that conversation was like, but I would have loved to have seen it and heard it. They didn't have good quality video cameras back then or iPhones like to capture that moment. To give you an idea of the magnitude of this, the case for Christ, and why the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Romans could not refute it, here are some people who saw Jesus and where. First of all, we have uh, them listed up here. At the cross, Jesus' mother, his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and the apostle John were at the cross. Mentioned by name. Uh-oh. That's pretty bold. And, you know, and the other words, Paul wasn't taking the easy way out, saying there were a bunch of people there at the cross. There were a bunch of women that followed him, and there were, he appeared to some of the disciples. That would be okay. We would still believe that. But Paul mentions a lot of names. At the tomb of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they got his body. They even went to Pilate. Pilate confirmed the death of Jesus. The Roman centurion, the centurion goes in there. Is it, um, Pilate says, is he dead already? Well, yeah, he died. So he confirmed it. Joseph of Arimathea, you can have the body. You can go prepare it for burial. Nicodemus, too. Uh, before the, the soldiers sealed up the tomb, they saw. Also Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph 
It says in Mark 15, 47, they saw where Jesus was laid. They saw, saw the men carry his body into the tomb and seal the tomb. I witness testimony. Resurrection Sunday, Mary Magdalene, the mother of James, uh, Mary the mother of James, two separate Marys. Salome, Salome brought uh, spices to anoint Jesus for burial. That's Mark 16, 1. The upper room, at least twice that we know of, it's written down probably a lot more times because if Jesus was on the earth for 40 days after his resurrection, I'm sure he spent more time teaching, that's what Luke says, teaching his disciples all about these things. How about on the road to Emmaus? On the road to Emmaus, two disciples, one of them mentioned by name, Cleopas. How about when they were eating with him after his resurrection? How about six of the disciples fishing along the shore? I believe that's in John 21, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, when Jesus says, come and have breakfast. He did say that, and he had fish cooking for breakfast and whatever else. And six disciples were there. They mentioned two of the names, Didymus and Nathaniel. How about at Jesus' ascension? We're going to get to this in a minute because we're jumping to Acts chapter 1 in a minute. And we'll read that. So a lot of people that were mentioned, a lot of names. Luke 24 mentions Mary, Joanna, and the other women. Are we making a case for Christ? Are we making this case right now? Okay. They returned from the tomb told the apostles they saw Jesus alive. First of all, Luke, as an author and a writer, I appreciate his meticulous descriptions, his attention to detail and the way he wrote, um, his journalistic account of Jesus. I love it. So, but by the way, <laughs> so we mentioned all these women go going to the tomb. Don't you think the gospel writers could have come up with a better story um, to make their heroes, the disciples, look better? You think about it. Peter, Peter denies Jesus and rebukes Jesus. James and John want to call down lightning from heaven. Judas betrays Jesus, and he was caught stealing money the whole time from the ministry, taking money out of the bag. One guy ran away naked when Jesus was arrested. Thomas doubts the resurrection until Jesus appears the second time. This is a bunch of, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a comedy here. You know, these guys bumbling. I mean, they're imperfect, right? But if you're writing something to... Um, substantiate your movement or your ministry or your religion, whatever it might be. You want to make your heroes look good. Why do, the Gospels don't do that. They don't go out of their way to make their heroes look good. And who in their right mind, at that time, who in their right mind would make the first document, the first person to see the risen Savior, a former demon-possessed woman, Mary Magdalene? Who would do that if you're trying to make the men, the disciples, look like the heroes? Plus, at least five women were the first to see the empty tomb. Not only is this embarrassing, now just reason with me here, common sense. Not only is this embarrassing that the men were hiding behind closed doors, right, in the upper room, but in that society, remember now, women saw Jesus first or saw the empty tomb first, in that society, a woman's testimony was not known as being reliable, as reliable or not highly valued. So why, if you're trying to make your case, it had to be true for them to do it the way they did it, because that is not the way, unless it really happened. You don't want women to be the first eyewitnesses, okay? Something to think about. If you're trying to start a religion, boy, they, uh, they're brutally honest, weren't they? So let's examine Luke's accounts uh, of Christ in the church, at least part of it. Let's look at Luke, as you know, Paul's personal physician, Dr. Luke. Um, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were at one time joined together as one book with two volumes, Luke and Acts. Now, go to Luke chapter 1. I think I have it up there if you want to just look at the verse there, but you can mark it in your Bible. Just the first four verses in Luke, remember Luke wrote Luke and then wrote Acts. He said in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, so Luke was a brainiac, in other words, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, 
Why? Right here, verse 4, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. I'm writing this so that you may know, you can confirm, this is reliable, this is true. You can have certainty of these things that you've been taught. So eyewitnesses, a lot of eyewitnesses, we talked about that word. A witness simply means a person who tells the truth about Jesus Christ. The Greek word has a meaning that says, uh, one who dies for his faith. A witness is one who dies for his faith because that was commonly the price in those days for testifying to the truth of Jesus and the resurrection. But think about this for a minute. Back up. We're, we're, we're digging in quite a bit here, but imagine if um, we went from, the, from, let's see, John's gospel and jumped right to Romans. Let, let's just say for, for a minute, Luke didn't write what he wrote over the number of years it took him to write Luke and Acts. So you'd be reading about the end of, end of John, which John says Jesus did many other things that the world would not even contain the books that could be written if, we, if we, you wrote everything down that Jesus did and said. I just paraphrased what John explained. So we don't have the full story, but we have enough evidence and facts and testimonies about miracles and Jesus' resurrection. So... You would be reading about John, what he's describing about Jesus, and then all of a sudden we'd be reading the book of Romans, and all of a sudden we'd be reading Paul writing to the followers at Rome. Uh, who was Paul? Where did he come from? Uh, how did the gospel get from Jerusalem to Rome? So the book of Acts answers these questions and tells the story of the good news spreading around the known world and the hard times that Paul went through in ministry. So thank God for Luke and Acts, those two books. I really appreciate these two. Um, one thing some people wrongly claim, like I mentioned before, is that um, the, things, the things that they wrote, that Luke wrote down, was written so far uh, later, so much later than the events, but that lie was debunked. Here's another thing. We know that 1 Corinthians, by the way, was written around 50 AD. The book of Acts well, let me, let me just ask you this question. If you're writing a history book on the, the United States, or even New York, let's just say New York, and that history book does not have anything, no mention of 9-11 and the terrorist attacks, the Twin Towers, the uh, Pentagon, the plane going into the Pentagon, uh, out in the field in Pennsylvania, and all the people that died on that day in 9-11. If there was no mention of that, and you're reading a history book of the United States, what could you conclude? That the book had to have been published before 9-11. Does that make sense? Just nod if you're tracking with me. The book of Acts had to be written before 70 AD. How do we know that? Because there's absolutely no mention of the destruction of the massive temple in Jerusalem. No mention. So we know that Acts, at least the book of Acts, was written before, earlier than 70 AD. So we're getting uh, 70, 35, roughly some years, 35 years after the resurrection. But we know Luke was written before that. Right? Because Luke preceded the book of Acts. However many years it took to write Luke, we don't know. But we can just surmise that some of these books, especially I think Mark was an early gospel, 1 Corinthians was one of the early, I think Galatians too, th those might have been some of the earliest documents we have, within about 15 years of the resurrection. Okay? Now, if you're 15 years old or younger, you do not have to answer this. But for the rest of us, can you remember something that happened in your life 15 years ago, which would have been 2004? Can you think back that far? If it was a life-changing, dramatic, major event that impacted history and everybody you knew around you, a political system, a religion, and something that was so astonishing that had never happened before, that was prophesied, do you think you would imagine, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, do you think you would remember that from 15 years earlier? Okay, so I'm just trying to reason with you a little bit. Now let's go to Acts chapter 3, because Luke often said, uh, mentioned prophetic things. Pl 
places, times, historical details. Luke was so precise and correct, and he had an amazing understanding of prophecy. And Acts chapter 3, verse 18 and 19 says this. Let's just go Acts chapter 3, 18. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, what things? That the Christ, the Messiah, would suffer. Those things God has thus fulfilled, Luke says. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So these prophecies were fulfilled by Jesus the Messiah. No need to look for a Messiah anymore. And so Luke is pointing to fulfilled prophecy, and then verse 19, he says, what do you do? Because of knowing Jesus is the Messiah, what do you do? Confess your sins, repent, acknowledge him as the Christ. Be converted so that your sins may be blotted out. And thank God we just celebrated communion. We, our sins have been blotted out, but we need to continually go to God and examine ourselves. Now, go to Acts chapter 1. We've been waiting all this time to get here. Acts chapter 1. So Luke is writing. We just wrote, read a little bit of what he wrote in Acts 3. Luke is writing, Acts chapter 1. Interesting how he starts it out. The former account I made, O Theophilus. What is he talking about? The Gospel of Luke. The former account, so this came later, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. What does that mean? Well, God the Father took up Jesus in his resurrected body from this world to his rightful place at the right hand of God. Until the day he was taken up, after he, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, verse 3, to whom he presented himself alive, when? After his suffering, after he, he died, by many infallible proofs. I think another translation says many convincing proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. They were so blessed to not only see the Messiah fulfill the prophecies, but then be taught by Jesus. Wow. But notice, 40 days. He, after his resurrection, he stayed another 40 days. Very important to remember. That's why there were so many eyewitnesses around that saw Jesus coming and going and teaching them. And then verse um, 6. When they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, we, we have a good understanding of what that means. The verb restore shows that the disciples were expecting a political kingdom. And the noun Israel, restore the kingdom of Israel, shows that they were expecting a national kingdom. And when it says this time, are you at this time, like now? Are we ready to go? It suggests that they were expecting its immediate establishment of this new kingdom of God. But how did Jesus answer them? What did he say? Verse 7, he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So before we discuss the return of Christ, because we're talking about his resurrection now, his appearances, Let's look at four things that are reasonable to believe about Jesus. Now, this should be in your bulletin as an insert. We've made copies and put this in your bulletin so you can think about this later. So we're going to go through this pretty quickly right now. There is good reason to believe the following. Number one, Jesus truly did die on the cross. Some, I think the, the Islam teaches that Jesus did not die on the cross, uh, I believe Islam also teaches that someone took Jesus' place 
and was crucified. It wasn't Jesus. So there's some lies out there. So we know, though, that Jesus did die on the cross. How do we know? Well, just some of these things. The Roman soldiers would not have allowed Jesus to survive. There was eyewitnesses that saw Jesus carry the cross and be nailed to the cross. The soldiers didn't break Jesus' legs. That was important. And that was a fulfilled prophecy. Not one of his, leg, not one of his bones will be broken. That's a fulfilled prophecy. John saw water coming from Jesus' side. Uh, one of the Gospels, um, it may have been John, says blood and water poured out of Jesus' side. What does that say? Well, medical experts have looked at that and said, he died. If his heart was still pumping, beating, it, it would be coming out in spurts, and it wouldn't have been blood and water like it was, so that the, it flowed out, the fact that it flowed out after the guy, the soldier, put the spear into Jesus' side, that's medically, all right, he was already dead. The living Jesus does not show up anywhere else in history, right? Also, the Bible offered an eyewitness to verify the death, and remember the soldier went to Pilate. Pilate said, is he dead already? Yes. He said, Joseph of Arimathea, you can take the body. He's dead. So, number two, the apostles didn't imagine the resurrection. Just a couple points here. No such thing as a group hallucination or a mass hallucination, whether that be 12 men in a room, hallucinating and seeing the same thing, or 500 of, the, of people at the same time, which it says in 1 Corinthians, no such thing as a mass hallucination. Everybody seeing the exact same vision or imagining something that didn't happen. No such thing. No psychiatrist would uh, tell you that, was, that would be remotely possible. Next, the corpse was never produced. No one ever found the body. The apostles claimed to be eyewitnesses. Why? Because they were. Number three, the resurrection is not merely a legend. First of all, there's not enough time for a legend to develop. And as we mentioned, the first eyewitnesses were women, which at that time would have been seen as unreliable. And number four, the apostles were not lying about the resurrection. First of all, where are they going to take the body? What are they going to do? What would have been their motivation? They, they could not have removed the body. The locals, who were not followers of Christ, the locals would have known about it. Can you imagine trying to keep something like that a secret? I mean, Jesus was followed by the masses. Everybody knew about it. All the Jews knew about it. The Romans, the, the soldiers all knew about it. You think someone's going to let Jesus' body slip out and be hidden somewhere? Not a chance. Also, they had no motive. What would be their motive? Be persecuted, hated, <laughs> suffer, die. You know what I mean? The motive for uh, lying about the resurrection. So back to Acts 1. Now we're in verse 9. Jesus just told them about the Holy Spirit and said, you will be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit gives us power to witness and to testify to the truth. Remember he said, when you're brought up in front of councils or arrested, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. Don't, have to worry, don't worry about what you're going to say in advance. Don't fear the Holy Spirit is in you. He'll give you the words. So, verse 9, now, when he had spoken those things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Remember the big cloud we talked about a couple weeks ago? Or Pastor Landon taught on the transfiguration? The cloud of glory, the Shekinah glory. This cloud received him out of their sight as they were looking. Verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, Jesus was ascending, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? So I, I like to think that... Uh, a spectacle, a miracle like that, seeing, witnessing the ascension. I don't know. How would you respond to that, you guys? Jaw on the floor? How long would you be there after it happened? How long would you be there going, did you see that? You know? Ten minutes? A half hour? It was probably silent. Maybe there were gasps at first when Jesus was ascending. But who knows how long? So these angels had to say, hey, <laughs> he's gone. You go, remember what he taught you now. So, the, so this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, 
Here's a big clue coming up, you guys. A big clue we're going to get to in a minute. Will return. He will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Verse 12. So we mentioned the cloud. We mentioned um, going up into heaven. We mentioned the angels. Now the mount called Olivet. We have a picture of it here. We're less than four weeks from what we traditionally celebrate as Palm Sunday. If you see in the left hand of this picture, there's a corner of, it looks like a building. Well, that's, that's the wall. That's the city wall of Jerusalem. And so out toward the east, to the right in the picture, you can see the Mount of Olives. The week before Jesus' crucifixion, he came from the Mount of Olives down through the Kidron Valley and then up again. That's why it often says we're going to go up to Jerusalem because the elevation was so high there in the city of Jerusalem. But the Mount of Olives, I think, is even a higher elevation. So down through the valley and then up to Jerusalem. They heard he was coming a week before what we know as Easter. They laid their coats in the road. We're going to celebrate this in a few weeks, celebrate the remembrance of this amazing event when they were shouting Hosanna. Um, the week before he came from there through the Kidron Valley and then entered Jerusalem through this gate that's close to the wall there on the east. He was riding a donkey, John 12, 14, which is another prophecy, by the way. I think it's Zechariah 9, 9. He'll be humble and riding on the foal of a donkey. So five centuries before the birth of Christ, the prophet Daniel predicted that exact event at that exact time, Daniel 9, 24 and 25, when the Messiah would enter Jerusalem and be worshipped. And Jesus, remember, he, he would always tell people not to speak or not to tell who he was. Palm Sunday, what did he say when the leaders were saying, these people are shouting Hosanna, they're calling you Savior, they're calling you Son of David, they're shouting Hosanna. You know, rebuke them, Jesus. What did he say? I tell you the truth, if these don't shout their praise, I'm paraphrasing, if these don't praise me, the stones will cry out. The rocks will cry out, Hosanna, if these people don't. For the first time, a week before his death, he allowed himself to be worshipped publicly. At the return of Jesus Christ, he will enter through this now cemented, sealed, eastern gate. Ezekiel 44, Nehemiah 3. Um, this significant gate in the city of Jerusalem, the only gate that is sealed up, the only one that is cemented by about 500 years ago, I think it was. Yep, it's been shut for about 500 years. The only gate in the city. I think there are eight gates around the walls of the Jerusalem. The gates are all open, except for one. Why did the Muslims close this gate? Because they know our holy book and what the, what the scriptures say about the return of the Messiah. They said, all right, he's, yeah, it says he's going to go through the eastern gate. We'll show him. <laughs> so they cemented the gate. It's cemented. <laughs> Like God couldn't blast through a cement wall, right? I mean, when, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil ripped and there was an earthquake so massive, even people outside the Bible wrote about this earthquake that happened when Jesus was on the cross. God shook the earth at that moment. It is finished. Not only that, this next picture here, you can see what's in front of there. See all those, the cement, the, the, the stone? Those are tombs. What did they do? They said, all right, if the cement wall won't keep them out, we're going to put a cemetery in front of the gate that the Messiah is supposed to enter into when he returns. Why? Because they're thinking, well, a, a holy man, a, the Messiah would never defile himself by going through a, a cemetery. Dead man's bones, right? Do you understand that this human reasoning? So the Messiah would never do that because th this wasn't there during Jesus' time. The gate was open. There's probably a path there down the, in the Kidron Valley. But they said, all right, we're not only going to cement it up, we'll put gravestones there. He'll never go through there. He can't fulfill that prophecy now. <laughs> all right, so go to Zechariah. Actually, I think I have it on the screen. If you want to mark it down in your notes, we got a little, little some room in your bulletin this week for notes. Zechariah 14.4. 4. 
when he returned in that day, what day? The day of the Lord. His feet, whose? The Messiah, Jesus. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west. There will be a massive earthquake again, splitting the Mount of Olives. You saw that picture. It's a pretty big mountain. Couldn't tell from the picture. But it will literally be split, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north. Half of the mountain will move toward the south. Zechariah 14.4. About 593 B.C., the prophet Ezekiel recorded this vision in the first four verses of Ezekiel chapter 43. Afterward, he brought me to the gate. Which one? There's eight gates. The gate that faces toward the east. Behold, the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters. How many of you have been to Niagara Falls? Or the ocean, you know, I mean, these, you can hear roaring waters sometimes. There's just a fraction of the power that God will display. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Verse 4, and the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. So be encouraged by the historical and prophetic evidence, many convincing proofs, Luke said, many infallible proofs, the evidence contained in God's word. We only know a fraction of what Jesus did, what he said, what he taught, but eyewitnesses have verified. Archaeology confirms, prophecy solidifies the many proofs, the case for Christ, the proofs of the resurrection of Jesus. It's not just a story, you guys. The Bible is true. It's real. And it's not just a history book. It is divinely inspired. And it proves also not only his resurrection, but it provides a lot of clues about the return of Christ. So what do we know about the return of Christ? From Scripture, we know what, we know why, we know how, and we know where. What don't we know? When. when. And this is something that should be on our minds all the time. It's hard to when we're living this temporary life here on earth. It's hard to because we're in these bodies and in, in this country and this culture and surrounded by darkness and sin and disease and imperfection, but it's temporary. Teach us to number our days, Lord, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. One day at a time, that's all that's required. And if Jesus doesn't return, well, for my age, for me personally, if he doesn't return within, I don't know, who knows, I'm not guaranteed tomorrow, but let's just say 40 years, I won't be here, and I'll be in one of these tombs in one of the local cemeteries or ashes somewhere, we're all going to be gone if Jesus doesn't return in our lifetime. But if he does, when? We better be ready. What does it say often in the New Testament? Watch. Watch, be prepared. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. You think Lambeau feels loud after a touchdown at a Packers game? Come on. He will descend with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, shall be caught up. That's where the word rapture comes from. Caught up. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Another translation says, encourage one another with these words. What are we doing this morning? We are encouraging one another with these words. Why? Because these words are true. And it's happened historically in the evidence, and the return is going to happen. Encourage one another with these words. John mentions um, 
Well, we, we, this everlasting hope that we have, we talked about the hope that's an anchor. Well, that hope, Scripture tells us, can never perish, can never fade or fail. Luke, remember, said Acts was written so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Another translation, so that you can have certainty. John mentions many other signs Jesus performed, things the disciples witnessed. And John says, in John 20, uh, 30 and 31, it says, so that you, these have been written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you can have life in his name. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, back to 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, and we're done. 1 Corinthians 15. Well, by the way, that's a great, it's that chapter, phenomenal. It starts off with the gospel, talks about the resurrection body and the imperfections, but how we will be glorified, and then it ends with such great hope. But here, um, 15, verse 51 and 52, Paul writes, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, or blink of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, incorruptible or imperishable, and we shall be changed. And I'll add, forever. Forever. Everlasting life for those who believe. This is the truth. This is our hope. The resurrection guarantees that we as believers will live. We will appear before Christ in his presence. We will be like him, the Bible says. And we will be filled with joy in his presence forever. Is that worth some of the hard times and the trials and the, the pains of this life? Absolutely yes. Absolutely it's worth it. Because this life is but a vapor. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not going to call anybody up, but if you do not know him personally, if you do not have a relationship with the one true God, with Jesus, meaning you can pray with him, you can pray to him, you can converse with him every day. He can be your God and your hope and give you that security. If you don't have the assurance of eternal life, right where you're sitting right now, I challenge you and encourage you to do business with God in your heart and commit to him. If you've never done that, I see some new faces. I'm still getting to, getting to know people here at this church. Do business with God. You can have such an amazing, abundant life here with him, his presence, and the power that he promised to get us through, to enable us to live this life. Thank God for the Holy Spirit, hey? But if you haven't, if you don't know him, or maybe you haven't been walking with him, you're thank God you're here this morning. If you've fallen away a little bit, he hasn't moved. His address is still the same. Come back to him. He loves you, but he's not a tolerant God when it comes to sin and evil. He wants you to come back to him. Praise God, we have such a hope. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for renewing our hope and building our faith on these truths from your word. We thank you, God, that your word is true. We thank you for... We don't need the extra evidence or the extra historians or the extra biblical testimonies, but it's just so amazing when we put it all together and we have so much that cannot be refuted. But we know people will. We know people will choose not to believe because it is an act of the will. And we ask, Lord, first of all, uh, praising you for what you're doing here in this body of believers. But Lord, for those in our sphere of influence, when we leave this place, 
We know a lot of people are in different places in their faith, some unbelievers, some believers that are loving this world and walking according to the things of this world and not according to your word. Well, we ask that you would use us to sometimes gently encourage and sometimes use us to challenge, Lord, our professing brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, we are your witnesses. We are your servants. And we want to do what you've called us to do. So use us to share this good news, the truth that we need so desperately here in this world. We need it. And God, we thank you that we have a living hope that can never fade and never will fail. We praise you, Lord, for your goodness and for speaking to our hearts this morning. We thank you for the worship. We thank you for allowing us to have communion with you and and come back to you and repent of our sins. And we thank you for giving us a clean slate. And we praise you for this message of truth and the hope we have in the resurrection. We look forward to it, Lord. We don't know when. It's the only thing we don't know. So, Father, one day at a time, help us to live according to your word. Help us to love others, even those that are hard to love. And, and Father, I pray that uh, you would help us not be (laughs) hard to love at times. Um, Give us patience, and thank you for the fruit of self-control and love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. Thank you again, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory for your truth, that you are a God who never changes, and your word is eternal, and we rest in that and trust in that again. In Jesus' name, amen.